Charlotte Doyle, Chapter 10 Captain Jaggery strode across the room and from the wall removed the portrait of his daughter. Affixed to its back was a key. With this he unlocked the gun safe, and in a moment he and Mr. Hollybrass were by the door, ready. The captain held two muskets and had two pistols tucked in his belt. Mr. Hollybrass was similarly armed. Terrified by the response my words had caused, I simply stood where I'd been. The captain would have none of that. Miss Doyle, you are to come with us. But, but, do as I tell you, he shouted. There's no time for delay. He flung one of his muskets to Mr. Hollybrass, who miraculously caught it, then grabbed me by an arm and pulled me after him. We ran out along the steerage into the waist of the ship and then quickly mounted to the quarter deck. Only then did the captain let me go. He now gasped, grasped the bell clapper and began to pull wildly as though announcing a fire and shouting, All hands! All hands! That done, he held his hand out to Mr. Hollybrass, who returned the extra musket to him. I looked about, not knowing what to expect, save that I truly feared for my life. Then I realized that the ship appeared to be completely unmanned. Not a sailor was to be seen anywhere, aloft or on the deck. The sails hung like dead cloth. The wheel was abandoned. The rigging rattled with eerie irrelevance. The Seahawk was adrift. The first person to appear below us was Mr. Keach. Within seconds of the bell sounding, he came bolting from below, took one look at the captain and Mr. Hollybrass armed above him and stopped short, and then turned as if expecting to see others. He was alone. Mr. Keach, the captain cried out, where do you stand? The second mate turned back to the captain, a look of panicky confusion upon his face. But before he could respond or act on the captain's question, the rest of the crew burst from beneath the forecastle deck with wild, blood-curdling yells. The crew's first appearance was fierce enough, though almost grotesquely comical, nine of them looking like so many beggars. When I'd seen them on the day we went to sea, they seemed unkempt. Now they looked destitute, their clothing torn and dirty, their faces unshaved, their expressions contorted with fear and fury. Of the nine, only Zachariah was not armed. The rest were. Some carried pistols. I recall two having swords. Dillingham had an ancient cutlass in hand. Barlow, a knife. Hardly had they flown out upon the deck than they perceived the captain standing on the quarter deck. One musket pointing directly at them and the other leaning against the rail within easy reach. They stopped frozen. If they had rushed forward, they might have overwhelmed the three of us, but it was now Captain Jaggery and the muskets that held them in check. With a start, I realized there was a tenth man standing below us. He was muscular and stocky, with a red kerchief tied around his neck and a sword in his hand. As I looked at him in astonishment, I saw that he had but one arm. I recalled Zachariah's tale of the sailor the captain had so severely punished, the man whose arm was so beaten that it had to be amputated. Standing before us was Cranick himself. It was his face I had seen in top cargo, the stowaway. I gasped. Captain Jaggery stepped swiftly to the rail and spoke. Ah, it is Mr. Cranick, he said boldly, holding his musket aimed directly at the man's burly chest. I wondered where you'd gone, not to hell as I'd hoped, but here, may I, he went on with a heavy sarcasm, be the last to welcome you aboard the Seahawk. The man took a shuffled step forward. He was clearly the crew's leader. Mr. Jaggery, he began, pointedly declining to say captain, I said we would be revenged upon you, did I not? I heard your usual brag, Mr. Cranick, if that's what you mean the captain replied, but I paid no more mind to it than I, I do now. At that, Cranick lifted his one hand and still managed to hold the sword, savagely pulled a paper from where it had been tucked into his trousers. He held the paper up. Mr. Jaggery, he called, his voice ragged, we've got a round robin here which declares you unfit to be captain of the Seahawk. There were murmurs of agreement from behind him. 
And what do you intend to do with it, Mr. Cranick? The captain retorted. I should think even you and your mongrel ignorance would know the days of piracy are long gone. Or do you have that much desire to bring back the practice of hanging in chains? or letting men rot so the crows might peck upon their putrid eyes. No piracy for us, Mr. Jaggery, Cranick replied with a vigorous shake of his head. Only justice. We could only not get it on land. We shall have it at sea. Justice, say you? Under whose authority? The captain demanded. All of us, our authority, Cranick cried and made half a turn to the men behind him. There were murmurs and nods of approval. And what kind of justice do you offer, the captain asked. Nothing precisely legal, I presume. We demand you stand before us in trial of your peers, Cranick answered. Trial? Peers? The captain cried mockingly. I see nothing but ruffians and villains, the scum of the sea. Then we proclaim ourselves your peers, Cranick cried. And with that, he flung down the paper and took a step forward. You can have anyone you want defend you, he persisted. Have that girl, if you like. She seems to be your eyes and ears. Let her be your mouth, too. It was at that exact moment that Captain Jaggery fired his musket. The roar was stupendous. The ball struck Cranick square in the chest. With a cry of pain and mortal shock, he dropped his sword and stumbled backward into the crowd. They were too stunned to catch him, but instead leaped back so that Cranick fell to the deck with a sickening thud. He began to groan and thrash about in dreadful agony, blood pulsing from his chest and mouth in ghastly gushes. I screamed. Mr. Hollybrass moaned. In horror, the crew retreated further. Captain Jaggery hastily dropped his spent musket, picked up the second, and aimed it into their midst. Who shall be next? he screamed at them. To a man, they looked up with burning, terrified eyes. Let Cranick lie there, the captain continued to shout. Anyone who moves forward shall receive the same. The crew began to edge further away. Leave your guns and swords, the captain shouted. Quickly, I'll fire upon the first two dozen. Pistols, swords, and knives dropped in a clatter. Mr. Hollybrass, collect them. The first mate scurried down the steps and while glancing upward began to gather the weapons. It was clear he feared the captain more than the crew. They're round Robin, too, the captain called to him. Too shocked to speak, I could only watch and feel enormous pain. Cranick had stopped moving. The only sign of life in him were the small, pink bubbles of blood that frothed upon his lips. It was then I saw Zacharias slip from the frozen tableau and move toward the fallen man. He held his hands before him, waist high, palms up as if to prove he carried no weapon. He kept his eyes on the captain. Let him be, Mr. Zachariah, the captain barked. He's a stowaway. He has no claim to any care. The old man paused. As a man, he said in a voice wonderfully calm amidst the chaos, he claims our mercy. The captain lifted his musket. No, he said firmly. Zachariah looked at him and then at Cranick. I may have imagined it, but I believe he may have even looked at me. In any case, he continued on with slow, deliberate steps toward the fallen man. I watched, terrified, but fascinated, certain that the angry captain would shoot. I saw his finger on the trigger tighten, but then he relaxed. Zachariah knelt by Cranick and put his hand to the man's wrist. He let it fall. Mr. Cranick is no more he announced. The stillness that followed these words was broken only by the soft, sudden flutter of a sail, the tinkling toll of a chain. Get him over, the captain said finally. No one moved. Mr. Zachariah, the captain repeated with impatience, get him over. Once again, Zachariah held out his open hands. Begging the captain's pardon, he said, even a poor sinner such as he should have a Christian service. Mr. Hollybrass, the captain barked. The first mate, having unloaded the crew's pistols, had returned to the quarter deck. Sir, he said, I want that dog's carcass thrown over. 
Cannot Mr. Zacharias say a few words? Mr. Hollygrass, do as you're ordered. The man looked from the captain to the crew. Aye, aye, sir, he said softly. Then slowly, as if a great weight had been cast upon him, he descended to the deck. Taking hold of the fallen man by his one arm, he began to drag him toward the rail. In his wake, he left a trail of blood. Mr. Zachariah, the captain thundered, open the gate. Zachariah gazed at the captain. Slowly, he shook his head. For a moment, the two merely looked at one another, and then the captain turned to me. Miss Doyle, open the gate. I stared at him in shocked disbelief. Miss Doyle, he now screamed in livid rage. Sir, I stammered, open the gate. I, I, I can't. Abruptly, the captain himself marched down the steps, pistol in hand. When he approached the railing, he tucked one gun under his arm and quickly unlatched the gate so it stood gaping above the sea. Mr. Hollybrass, he snapped. Mr. Hollybrass, sweat running down his hot red face, pulled the body close, but then he paused and offered a look of appeal to Captain Jaggery. The captain spat on Cranick's body. Over, he insisted. The first mate pushed the body through the gate opening, and there was a splash. My stomach turned. I saw some of the sailors wince. The captain spoke again. Mr. Cranick was not a part of this ship. His coming and going have nothing to do with us. They shall not even be entered in the log. Beyond all that, you should know you are a very poor set of curs. It took only this girl, he nodded to me, to unmask you. Sullen eyes turned toward me. Ashamed, I looked away, trying to stifle my tears. As for the rest, the captain continued, I ask only that one of you, your second in command, if you have one, come forward and take his punishment. Then the voyage shall go on as before. Who shall it be? When no one spoke, the captain turned to me. Miss Doyle, as our lady, I give you the privilege. Which of these men shall you choose? I gazed at him in horrified astonishment. Yes, you. It was you who uncovered this despicable plot. I give you the honor of ending it. Whom shall you pick to set an example? I could only shake my head. Come, come, not so shy. You must have some favorite. Please, sir, I whispered. I gazed down on the crew, looking now like so many broken animals. I, I, I don't want. If you are too soft, then I shall choose. Captain Jaggery, I attempted to plead. He contemplated the men, and then he said, Mr. Zachariah, step forward. 